Hello everybody, my name is Richard McSherry. I'm the pastor of the Shaftesbury Church and we're coming to you on CAT TV here in Bennington and we're filming at the First Baptist Church in Bennington and we're thankful for their generosity and loaning us their space and their time. And we're glad that you could be with us today as, we, uh, as we're moving into spring and uh, that's giving us a little optimism for the future. So we're glad you could be with us today. Uh, let's, uh, let's turn to God in prayer at this time. Loving God, we just rest in your presence and we await your appearing expectantly and with hope. We thank you, Lord, that as you bind us together as your people, you will show us your way. We thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers, each and every one, and you answer as what is best for us, your children. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought us together here via this media. We're thankful for that. And gracious God, as we enter into worship, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us. Your Holy Spirit will just infuse this service as we stand on that promise where two or three are gathered in the precious name of Jesus, you are in their midst. Amen. Well, we're going to begin with our first hymn, and we won't be singing it, but we will be reading it um, responsively, and um, Sue is coming forward for that as well. And the first hymn is Father in Whom We Live. Father, in whom we live, in whom we are and move, the glory, power, and praise receive for thy creating love. Let all the angel throng give thanks to God on high, while earth repeats the joyful song and echoes to the sky. Incarnate deity, let all the ransomed race render in thanks their lives to thee for thy redeeming grace. The grace to sinners showed ye, heavenly choirs proclaim, and cry, salvation to our God, salvation to the Lamb. Spirit of holiness, let all your saints adore thy sacred energy and bless thine heart-renewing power. Not angel tongues can tell thy love's ecstatic height, the glorious joy unspeakable, the beautific sight. Eternal triune God, let all the hosts above, let all the sons of men record and dwell upon your love. When heaven and earth are fled before thy glorious face, sing all the saints thy love hath made, thine everlasting praise. And at this time we're going to have a, a responsive reading as well from the book of Psalms. It's Psalm 100 and 47 oh. if you oh i'm sorry it's i believe it's psalm one psalm one that's right i changed that and i immediately forgot anyway so it's psalm one the very first psalm in the bible if you care to follow along in your bible uh please do so Blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water that yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do they prosper. The wicked are not so but are like chaff, which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, or sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked will perish. And we're going to uh, turn to the Lord in prayer at this time, and uh, um, we're going to bring up some general prayers, and. Uh, I'm going to just pause at some point, and so if there's something on your heart, you can lift that to the Lord, and then we'll conclude with the words that Jesus gave us. Gracious God, we come to you with joyful hearts. We thank you for this turn of the season and this looking forward to spring, and we see little signs of new life around us just beginning. 
We thank you, Lord, that um, there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel, that vaccines are getting out, there's more inoculations, and, and folks are, are looking at a, at a brighter and a better day. And we just pray, God, that you'll keep us encouraged through these difficult times. We thank you for the, the doctors and the medical personnel and all of the various organizations that, uh, that are doing all that they can to, to see that your, your work is done in the world and that health is restored. We want to thank you, Lord, especially for the Red Cross and all that they do, Lord, and bless their work uh, in the world. And it's very difficult to do all that they need to do in the face of this pandemic. We want to thank you for um, our church and our church, our host church, you might say, the First Baptist here in Bennington, and all of our churches that seek to make the love of Jesus known to neighbor and friend and stranger alike. We pray for those who are on foreign fields and who are showing the love of Jesus to those around us. We thank you, Lord, for those who seek peace in the world. There are still many uh, areas that are troubled, and we just pray that uh, your peace will come in those areas as well, dear Lord. And gracious God, we pray, uh, we pray for ourselves. We pray that we will truly be the people you have called us to be. And now, Lord, we pause to lift up silently those things which might be on our heart today. And praying the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Well, Sue is coming forward again to, to share in our second hymn, which is uh, Shackled by a Heavy Burden. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know. He touched me and made me whole. Since I met this blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know. He touched me and made me whole. Amen. As we come to that time where we want to receive our tithes and offerings, uh, I am so impressed that uh, even in the spirit of, um, of, of, of things, people continue to give and to reach out with the limitations placed upon us by this pandemic. I've even read stories of children who've come up with very creative ways to raise funds and to help in things that have touched their hearts and their lives. What an inspiration that is that even children can raise up and do something for others. We can too, of course. So as you prayerfully consider what you can give of time, talent, and treasure, do so in that same spirit. Amen. This time we'll have our uh, scripture readings. And the reading from the Old Testament today is from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. 
You shall have no other gods besides me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, and I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And today's reading from the New Testament is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are, who are being saved, we know it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ was crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called by God, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And the Gospel reading today is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. Then the disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. 
After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have heard your word, we have heard your word, and we just pray that as we meditate on it, we will see new things, new and wonderful things, and that they will take root in our hearts and our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. My Father's House. You know, this was uh, perhaps, or is perhaps, we, we should say, one of the most uh, difficult pictures or portrayals or however you want to say it that we have of Jesus in the entire New Testament. Here Jesus is clearly upset with the way things are going and the status quo, as it were, simply will not do. Things must change, and they must change now. All four of the New Testament Gospels include this account of the cleansing of the temple. So we can safely assume that this was a critically important event. The temple, we remember, was the very epicenter of Jewish life and worship. It was here that God met the Hebrew people, like no other place on this earth, here at the very center of the holy city of Jerusalem. The temple was unlike a, a local synagogue, very unlike that. Its function was unique among all Jewish religious structures in the world. There was one temple, and this was it. It was not just another gathering place for worship or study. It was the sanctuary for the Jewish people. It isn't quite the same, but one may think of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and its importance for the Roman Catholic community as somewhat of an analogy. Herod, you see, was the great builder of his day, and he wanted to be remembered, and he was to be called the great and it was largely due to these stupendous architectural monuments that he had built. Of Herod's building projects, none were greater than this building, this temple at Jerusalem. And he had it expanded and enlarged and made more and more elegant. And it sat on what we now call the Temple Mount. And if you see pictures of Jerusalem in today, you'll still see that great domed edifice, gilded dome edifice that crowns the city. An area of some 35 acres in the middle of a very crowded city. Only priests could enter, enter the temple, which took up a small part of the mount and was surrounded by three courts. There were three outer courts. The Jewish men could enter the court closest to the temple, and the women could occupy the next court and the court of the Gentiles was the court farthest from the center of the temple. And that was the closest that any non-Jew could get to the, to the sanctuary. You see, even in that day, there were people outside of the Hebrew community who came to acknowledge the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the true God. And they wanted to be near him as well. To go up to Jerusalem was a singular spiritual experience for any Jew of Jesus' day. It was a journey that would be remembered for a lifetime. And it was here that sacrifice was offered by the people. And everyone was called upon to offer those sacrifices. Now this event that uh, we just heard read about took place at a critically important time in the life of first century Palestine. It was the season of Passover, or Pesach, this holiday commemorates the deliverance of God's people from Egypt and bondage and the beginning of that great 
migration to a new and holy and promised land. Someone reminds us the Passover was the greatest of all Jewish feasts. The law laid down that every adult male who lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem was bound to attend it. But it was not only the Jews in Palestine who came to the Passover. By this time, Jews, of course, have been scattered all over the world in the great diaspora. But they never forgot, never, their ancestral faith and home. And it was the dream and aim of every Jewish person, no matter in what land they were staying, to celebrate at least one Passover in the holy city of Jerusalem. And astonishing as it may sound, it is likely that as many as two and a quarter million people would assemble in the holy city to keep the Passover. We can just about imagine how crowded that city must have been. It was a far, far smaller city than any comparable city in the world today. The temple itself is linked to that great event, that great event of Passover. In Leviticus 23, we read, these are the Lord's appointed festivals, sacred assemblies, that you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast, and on the first day hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days present a food offering to the Lord, and on the seventh day hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. So there were very specific regulations as to just how that Passover was to be celebrated. And so from every corner of the known world, faithful Jewish people would come to the temple to celebrate uh, and sacrifice to the Lord in obedience to his commands. In order to provide the appropriate sacrifices, they had to purchase them once they had arrived in the holy city. And this became, over time, a kind of a tangled web because in order to pay for the sacrifices, Ordinary, everyday currency had to be exchanged for so-called temple currency. If you took a weekend or a vacation in Montreal, you'd have to exchange your American dollars for Canadian dollars. Or if you went to England, you'd have to exchange them for pound sterling or the euro in Europe, wherever it might be. And it was, it was really akin to that. And so money changers were set up in the outer courts to convert everyday Roman currency into the temple currency. You see, Roman currency often depicted pictures of the emperors of Rome on the face of their coins, and this was held to be in violation of the Ten Commandments, the very commandments that Sue had read earlier, and the prohibition against graven images. They took this very seriously. As someone reminds us, though not inherently evil, these practices became an occasion for sin. Pilgrims paid greatly highly inflated rates to change that money, and sellers exploited those in poverty, overcharging for the poor man's offering of pigeons and doves. To make things worse, these merchants set up shot, shop in the very court of the Gentiles. Remember that court? It was the, the furthest one from the center of the temple. Well, that's where they set up shop, pushing out, pushing out these Gentile believers and making it useless as a place of prayer because of the hustle and the bustle of commerce that was going on there. That's why Jesus drove out the sellers. These merchants and the priests who allowed their presence cared nothing for real worship as long as they could make money and keep up the appropriate rituals. Our Savior hated the sacrilege which kept the nations from learning about the living God in his sanctuary. All of these people were shunned out. You see, the court of the Gentiles was the only section they could go to. And it's the only place they could be close to God's presence. But the money changers setting up shop effectively shut those Gentiles out of God's presence. Christ's very mission on this earth was to obliterate that kind of thing completely. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Ephesians, reminds us of this when he writes about the reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles, between all people. That's the message here. Paul said, 
Remember that at one time you, speaking of the Gentile nations, were separate from Christ and were excluded from citizenship in heaven and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away, those who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made these two groups the Jews and the Gentiles, and that's everyone, these two groups. He's destroyed the barrier and the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them, the Jewish people and the Gentile people to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. And you know, as far back as the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah said, has my house, which bears my name, that temple bared God's name, remember, has my house become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. See, he's... He didn't miss out on that. He saw what was going on. So that day when Jesus entered the precincts of the temple and witnessed what was going on, he saw what God had seen centuries before and testified to through the words of the prophet Jeremiah. You see, what enraged Jesus was that pilgrims to the Passover who could ill afford it were being fleeced at an exorbitant rate by these money changers. And it was a rampant and shameless injustice. And what was worse, it was being done in the name, the very name of religion. God's plan was to reach out to those who did not know him, to those who were near but very far away. That is the expansive love of God for humanity. And that was God's plan from the very beginning. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah said, and foreigners, foreigners, he's very clear who he's talking about, who bind themselves to the Lord and minister to the Lord, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, I will gather together others to them besides those already gathered. I will bring you to the holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. The house of God should be a house of joy where everyone is, is invited. A house of prayer for all nations. God's house should be one of happiness instead of sorrow, a place of comfort for the afflicted, acceptance by the rejected, and comfort for those who grieve and sorrow. And when God's house became something else, as it did in Jesus' day, it lost what it was actually created for, a meeting place between God and his people. God's house should always be one in which when we enter, we leave as transformed people. We don't go away the same way as we entered in. Jesus is confronted by some of the religious authorities who demand by what right he has to do such a thing. And Jesus answers in a way that seems strange to them. He says, destroy this temple. 35 acres of buildings. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What? You can just see them standing there scratching their heads wondering what this man is talking about. But of course Jesus was referring to himself, to his own body. He's referring to his ultimate and final sacrifice. For you see, after that, after Calvary, after the cross, after the empty tomb, these things would no longer be needed. There would be no need for additional sacrifices. Things would change at that moment for eternity. Remember Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well? Here was a woman who had, shall we say, a past, and a checkered past at best, and they have a discussion on the topic of worship. Kind of interesting what people would bring up to Jesus at different times when they encountered him. Jesus asked her for a drink of water, 
We can well imagine it was probably a hot and dusty day, and so a simple request for a little cup of water. And Jesus uses this moment for a teaching lesson, doesn't he? John records that in chapter 4. He says, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is very deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob, who gave us this very well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone, everyone who drinks this water, this water from that very special well given by Jacob, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up inside them unto eternal life. And the woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw the water. We can imagine that every day one of her daily chores was to probably go down there and fill her water jugs and take them back heavy as they were to her home. Jesus told her, go and call your husband and come back. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you're right. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. Well, there you go. Mm -mm. What you have said is quite true, she said. Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. So when Jesus delved into her soul, she knew that this was some special person she was dealing with. And then she asked, she continues this interestingly after that statement, she continues and she says, well our ancestors worshipped on the mountain, but you Jews claim that the place for worship is in Jerusalem, at the temple there. You know, she's, ha she's having a theological debate with the Son of God, imagine. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samar Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come. He's saying, it's, it's here, it's here now. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kinds of worshipers the, spirit, the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. See, there's no more need of, of temples and mountains and sacrifices, but simply a heart transformed by the presence of the living Christ, a heart surrendered to Jesus. And the promise remains true for all of us. As John chapter 1 says, to all, he says all, there's no exceptions, Jews, Gentiles, this or that, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. When we turn to Christ, when we invite the risen Savior into our hearts, he enters in just as he promised, and he begins the work of house cleaning. And he leaves us far, far better than he found us. Someone reminds us, God is still cleansing the temple. Isn't that interesting? He's still cleansing the temple. But not the one in Jerusalem. That one's gone, destroyed. The temple that I speak of is with a little t, a lowercase t. And it's our, own, it's our own body in whom the Spirit of God dwells. The Apostle Paul makes a clear distinction between the actual physical temple of Jerusalem and the believer in whom Christ dwells and has become, through the Holy Spirit, a temple for God. Paul writes, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Just as in ancient Israel, they did not own the temple. And it is the presence of the living Christ in which makes the whole world, the whole world, everyone who invites him in, into a temple of God. 
So John says that when they remembered, they saw in this a promise of the resurrection. They did not see that at the time. They could not. It was only their own experience of the living Christ, which one day showed them the true depth of what Jesus said. You and I have, there, have here the tremendous truth that our contact with God, our entry into God's presence, and our approach to him is not dependent on anything that human hands can build or human minds devise, no matter how stupendous it might be. Rather, in the street and the home at business, sitting in our favorite coffee shop, on the open road, or in church, we have an inner temple don't we? We have an inner temple that's the dwelling place of God, the presence of the risen Christ forever with us throughout the whole world and for all time. That goes for whosoever will. As the Bible said, God so loved the world that whosoever will, that's who it belongs to. Those who turn to the Lord in trusting, living faith become his temple. That's pretty exciting stuff. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your presence in our lives, in our hearts. We thank you, you that you have knitted us together into a family as well, which is called the body of Christ, the church, that living organism on earth. We just pray, Lord, that we will be good stewards of this temple which you've given us. Amen. As Sue comes forward, um, we're going to be sharing our, our final hymn, and uh, it's one some of you might know. It's entitled, The Church's One Foundation, and it reminds us, it reminds us of our rootedness in Christ and that sure foundation that we have in spite of so many things. The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. We are the new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and taught us what perfect love can be. Though light, through life and death he sought us and rose to set us free. The church in every nation is one through all the earth. Our charter of salvation, one God, one faith, one birth. One name together blessing, one holy food we share to one hope ever pressing at one in work and prayer. Still divisions, tribulation, and hatred fuel our war. We wait the consummation of peace forevermore. The saints, their watch are keeping, their cry goes up how long? And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Yet we on earth have union with God the three in one. And mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O oh, happy ones and holy. God give us grace that we, like them, the meek and the lowly, may live eternally. Amen. Well, we want to thank you for being with us uh, today and uh, we trust that you are well and pray that you'll continue to be healthy in these difficult times and uh, that you'll sense that presence of God in your heart and your life each and every moment. Let's pray for God's blessing. Now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the watch care of God the Father be with you today and tomorrow, and even until the end of the world. Amen.